Good morning, folks. So, how is Lab 4 going? That was a definite maybe I saw over there. Is it uh, the, the, by popular demand, the lab will open tomorrow as soon as I get here, which will probably be, will be before 8, but I'll, I'll, I'll almost assuredly open by 8 tomorrow morning. <clears throat> um, might be earlier. We can run till 1 tomorrow, but then we have to probably, I mean, we most likely have to get out of there because 2300 is in there on Tuesday afternoons, except sometimes they're not. And if they don't show up, then we can stay. I will have to leave tomorrow morning for an hour, but I'll leave you alone in there. Uh, I have to do a, a 1050 on the presentation on the wonders of electrical engineering. It's always entertaining. So, any questions on Lab 4? Can we talk a little bit more about the motor control side? I'm just motor, motor control thread, okay. So the so the question is in the in the in the motor control thread, how do you normalize the PWM signal? And the answer is you do not. You are going to calculate. You are going to calculate p times the error error plus a, a d term plus an i term. And that is what you're going to put out of the port. No normalization, no nothing, except that if it's less, if it's, if the PWM value you get is less than zero, then clamp it to zero. And if it's, if the PWM comes up greater than PWM max, Clamp it to PWM max. So you you clip it at zero and you clip it at whatever you're choosing for your for your timer period, which I'm recommending should be forty thousand. If the prescaler is set to one, then forty thousand counts at 40 megahertz is one millisecond, which is what I'm suggesting you want to run the opto-isolator at. You can run it a little slower. You cannot run it any faster. <clears throat> the 4N35 opto has a very low cutoff frequency. So you're not, now the other channel, the RPM channel, should be normalized to 3000 RPM. So zero to three volts output gets mapped to zero to three thousand RPM. So that you are going to want to scale. But the, the main control signal you are not going to scale. If you do that, then you will guarantee that you never get 100% drive. Because you will all have always scaled it to less than 100% drive, and so you can never make you can never accelerate the motor as fast as you might possibly be able to. Does does that answer it? Yeah. yeah okay. What else? Saw some really yes. Go ahead. You can't have a negative output value because we can't put negative current through the motors. The motors are, are, are positive drive only. And in fact, the circuit that you're building is not capable of putting a negative current through the, through the motor. It's only capable of applying a positive voltage to the motor. 
So if you wanted to put a negative current through this motor, you'd have to do several things. One is use a motor that can take negative current. This motor simply burns up if you put minus 12 volts across it. Don't do that. Yes? So what I currently did is I have a value and I keep adding the PID value. But see, that's not the algorithm I gave you, is it? So you can do that if you want, if you can figure out how, because that's now an integral controller. It's a first order controller rather than a zeroth order controller. You ever taken control theory? No. But it, Don't do that. It is working. Well, it is working. It's just. So when the TAs come around to analyze this, they're going to say set P to some value, set I to some value, and if your system behaves differently, they're going to go minus 5. All right? Unless you can prove that it's correct. If you've taken control theory and you can prove it's correct, fine. Otherwise, you're really going to confuse the TAs. So think carefully about whether you know too much or not. We've all had the experience, I think in high school at least, of knowing too much and getting graded down for it. Uh, it never ends. <laughs> no, don't, 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 don't go too far afield. What you are describing is some other controller. What I'm saying here is I want, I want to be able to predict that if I double P, I have the error. Because that allows me to quickly check that your algorithm is correct. If you are doing something else, then we have to I have to recalibrate my brain, which I'll do, but it'll be slower to debug. And why would you want to do that? Because the integral term does precisely what you're talking about, so why not leave the, the proportional term the way it is? So what you're describing is, a, is an integral controller that has no proportional term. To make this go negative, you have to have a motor which is bilaterally symmetric. You have to be able to put current either way through it. You also have to change this from a simple switch into what's called an H bridge that allows you to, to flip switches around the motor. So an H bridge looks like this. Switch, switch, 12, ground, switch, switch, motor. So if you flip these two switches on, the motor runs one way. You flip these two switches on, the motor runs the other way. You flip them all on, the power supply explodes. So I'm leaving off all the protection stuff and all of the steering stuff. But basically you'd have four switches, typically two N channel and two P channel FETs that control this motor. That allows you to run the motor symmetrically. Again, the motors we have will not work this way. They'll merely be destroyed. So, when you turn on the, the, the motor, when you, if the motor is running slower than the command, so it's, it's running down here someplace, there's suddenly a command to speed up. The system should put full power to the motor as long as the error is big. When you then turn the pulse off again, the best you can do with this setup is to merely turn off the current and let the motor exponentially decay. So the best you can do on the slowdown mode and for that matter, if you overshoot here, the best you could do is to slow down exponentially. The best you can do is to slow down with the motor dynamics. You can't even short these motors and make them slow down. I'm thinking about changing the lab around next year and using just the nastiest little simple 12, uh, 12 volt DC motors that are reversible produce a phenomenal amount of RF noise. Uh, like volts of RF noise on a 12 volts on a 12 volt power supply. 
because that makes the opto isolation extremely critical which is a good demo maybe painful but it's a it's a good design demo and then the question is what should we do with it because whatever the lab is it has to be small enough that I can store 30 copies of it so it can't be some giant robot arm that reaches out and grabs something and it would be nice to have some sort of tachometer sensor but it could be an accelerometer if it was an angle thing so anybody got any ideas a very small very compact easily storable cheap under a fifty dollars or a hundred dollars per setup and that I can explain in less than a week those are the constraints the one thought I've had so far well there's two really one is to make a you have a balance arm so you don't need much power you put a, 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 a motor out here with a fan on it you put a counterweight over here and you make a helicopter a one-dimensional helicopter <clears throat> that has to hover at some angle and that would be interesting so that's a possibility because now all you have to store is you take these two sticks you fold them up you put them in the you put them in the case and for next year another possibility this is this is this is fun to try and figure out is a children's swing and the dynamics of of you know how you pump a swing you all you all know how to do it right you can go from zero to a full swing by just changing your center of mass oh how exactly is momentum conserved there exactly and what is the, the physics of this was only solved like 15 years ago over mechanical engineering <clears throat> so an interesting robot is to put a servo motor down here with a big counterweight on it hang this from the edge of the bench and have this thing pump itself into swinging back and forth so you have a a swing robot and then all you would have to store is this flat thing you make a clip up here that hooks it onto the onto the frame of the of the of the bench there's a servo motor I can afford those a single rod or maybe two rods for to men, for to keep it from swinging randomly that'd be a good final project either one of these might be a good final project <clears throat> now the next step is could you make it learn to do that could you make it could you make an adaptive setup that would learn to pump the swing by manipulating the servo motor or learn to hover at a given angle uh, through a neural net of some sort <coughs> but either of those would be uh, a fun, uh, interesting project or or you make this a little more complicated you put another motor here with a blade this way and you have it and a, and a hook like that right it has to take off turn 90 degrees and put the and put the uh, and pick up something and take it back and set it down now that'd be hard or just make it take off rotate 90 degrees and land just doing that would be quite interestingly hard and cheap to set up all it takes is time and money mostly time any other ideas motor projects love to hear them inverted pendulum. inverted pendulum that could be fairly small too particularly if you if you I mean the, the inverted pendula I've seen have taken several forms one is a wheeled robot that moves itself back and forth but you can also have a, a track with a with wheels on the track that with a with a rod sticking up like this and there's a hinge here so you have one dimensional motion you want the rod to be balanced that's a solved problem it's known how to do it. it takes some it takes a good control algorithm to do it though what's more entertaining and a good deal harder is you put a hinge here with another rod and have it balance both of them by moving back and forth that could be fairly compact although the track would be I'd have to figure out how to store a bunch of of uh, T channels or something and figure it out that's a possibility too Mm -hmm. 
Anything else on lab four? So I've seen that some interesting and, uh, and obscure uh, instrument f instrumentation failures. In one case, the input to the, the capture, the time capture, was a beautiful uniform square wave, no noise on it. The, the motor is running at constant RPM because it set it to full RPM. And the output is changing from zero, between zero, approximately 500 and approximately 1700. Something is interfering with the, with the pin dynamics. And the student didn't actually figure out what it was, they just changed pins and fixed it. I don't know. I don't know what it was. They changed pins. They went from RPB 13 to RA1 and fixed it. Have you seen that too? What? You had something like that? <laughs> input ca oh, oh, that's right. You had input capture 3 for whatever reason didn't work. You changed it to input capture 1 and it worked. It's probably a pin conflict also. But I, again, without going through all of the TFT dependencies, the P threads dependencies, it's hard to figure out where the, where the, capture, where the, where the conflict is. Anything else? Well, let's talk a little bit. Oh, so we'll be open tomorrow from um, um, approximately 8 till approximately 1, assuming that 2300 is in there. Wednesday, what time you want to open? 8 o'clock again? Yeah! Is it worthwhile? skipping lecture on Wednesday to work completely all the way through. Is there enough, is there enough demand for that? Yes. An extra hour in lab? All right, fine, we're skipping. But don't tell anybody that's not here. <laughs> Let them figure it out. <laughs> what else? Let's talk a little bit more about sound synthesis. Uh, I've tried three different methods of sound synthesis on microcontrollers. Mostly I've done this on 8-bit because I haven't used 32-bit long enough to have the time to do it. And uh, one is uh, spectral matching. So you get the you 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 get the sound spectrogram of a instrument. So T runs in this direction, frequency runs in this direction, and then the energy at a given frequency is given by a color at various at various points, and you match the sound spectrogram. Or alternatively, you take slices this way through the through the sound spectrogram, you take slices and match each of the spectra at different times to the instrument spectrum. And if you do that, you'll get something that sounds a lot like the instrument. So the, the next, that's fairly hard to do. It sounds, it sounds very Fourier straightforward, except getting the, all of the data necessary is difficult. The second but it's, uh, but it's quite, uh, um, you make a measurement, you do the synthesis. Then there's kind of the FM empirical. And that is you, you take a sine wave, you put an envelope on it. So if you want to do a bell, a very good approximation of a bell is to start at high amplitude and then exponentially decay the, the, the uh, sine wave. And if you make this around a thousand hertz and you make the amplitude reasonable, it'll go ding, sound like a, like a glass bell or, a, or a, some sort of other high Q, fairly 
rigid material. And so you could just say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a sine wave. I'm going to put an arbitrary rise and fall amplitude. So this is T and this is amplitude. So within this, you're getting larger and smaller sine wave. I'm just going to take a sine wave and I'm going to shape it according to a rise and fall time and see what it sounds like. And if you make this rise time fast, if you make this rise time short, then it sounds like a struck thing, struck instrument of some kind, like a banging on a pipe or, or banging on a glass. If you make the amplitude rise slow, so the system builds up energy, then it sounds more like a, like a resonant instrument, like a, blow, like a horn, where you add energy on each cycle until you get up to full amplitude because horns have very high Q. And so you can add energy for at least hundreds of cycles. And It'll, it'll either sound like a bowed string or a, or, a, or a blown instrument or something that has a slow rise time. And then you just play around with the parameters until you find something that sounds interesting. Now the next, to, to go even further on this, to make it FM, you have to allow this sine wave to change frequency all the time you're doing the synthesis. So it gets faster and slower and faster and slower all the uh, higher and lower frequency all the time you're doing the synthesis. So you might have a, a system that has a fast rise. So you start out at a high frequency and then you go to a lower frequency as it damps out. So you'd have both exponential damping and a frequency shift. Turns out real drums do that. Because the, when you strike a drum hard, it, brings, it deflects the surface. It makes the surface tighter because it's deflected. That raises the speed of sound on the surface and, and raises the frequency. <clears throat> so you can make a reasonably good sounding drum by, by putting a little bit of FM modulation, actually quite a bit of FM modulation, onto a damp sine wave. So in the limit then, you're going to use full FM. You're going to have a, a system that allows you to pick a carrier frequency, pick a modulation frequency, multiply them together, or, 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 or modulate one by the other, and then amplitude shape the whole thing. And you may actually have the modulation signal be shaped independently of the carrier. But there's no way of predicting what it's going to sound like. You just have to try a thousand different combinations of frequencies and amplitudes to say, see what sounds nice. I've spent way a lot too, much, too many hours doing exactly that on various microcontrollers and in MATLAB. Just playing with FM synth synthesizers because it's so much fun. <clears throat> Then the third method, and it, it turns out that FM synth requires significantly less computational capability than spectral matching. Third possibility is what's called physical modeling. Where you look at the equations which, which underlie an instrument and simulate them. So for a string, you have a stretch structure that's, that's more or less tightly constrained at each end. And you can, if you pluck it with some shape like that, then you're going to get traveling waves that bounce along the string, but have a boundary condition of zero on each end. If you solve the wave equation, and play out the amplitude, it'll sound like a string. <clears throat> if you do that in two dimensions, this is supposed to be a perspective version of a drum head. If you do this in two dimensions and allow each one of these points to deflect up and down, 
and you make this about 10 by 10 or bigger and then flex the surface, give the surface an initial distribution that looks more or less Gaussian, then you'll get a drum sound out. That's fairly expensive to compute. One dimensional wave equation is not very expensive to compute uh, due to the Karplus strong algorithm. And there are variants of that that are used for other kinds of instruments. Uh, there's a guy at Stanford who is, has, has exploited this technique for making 2D instruments like drums, 3D instruments like Tibetan singing bowls that, that has resonances throughout a three-dimensional structure in a non-trivial way. There, there, there's radial symmetry, there's symmetry along one axis which allows you to have Let's see, if it was in three dimensions, it would be called a spherical harmonic. What is it? It's a uh, cylindrical harmonics. You have cylindrical harmonics in one direction and unterminated reflections in the other direction. It's a very interesting sound. All three of these are accessible by, on the microcontroller, depending on what kind of instrument you want to do. And how many voices you want. Two FM voices on the PIC32 take something like 5% of the CPU. Two, two spectral matching voices, each with 10, well, let's say five harmonics, takes maybe 30% of the CPU. One string using Karplus Strong takes maybe 2 or 3% of the CPU. So you can generate a lot of simultaneous string sounds. Last year we had people try to do piano synthesizers which require three struck strings for each note and they wanted ten notes, one for each finger, so they had thirty strings they could add together since you could play all of them at once. And that ran in real time at uh, ten kilohertz I believe. So you can do a lot of strings. Does anybody see using these? I've heard several people talk about synthesizers of various sorts or, or musical instruments of various sorts. I can go through these. There is some code. There is some code on the on the current web page and then there's some code on the previous web page for the course back in the bad old AVR days the current the current attempts are under the on the DSP page there's a bunch of stuff about speech compression which you've probably already looked at and then this thing on FM sound synthesis which talks about how to do FM, FM synthesis. And I think I, I played one or two of these things before I messed up the link the other day. Ooh, it's not going to play it unless I... Oh, thank you. I guess I'm not going to play that today. So... Um, and then a filter bank uh, spectral analyzer, which you're not interested in this context. So the main thing I've done so far on this uh, CPU is FM sound synthesis. But if we go back to the old AVR page, which you can get to there, right there, it says old AVR based homepage. It's on this page, it's just not very obvious. Go down to the links, DSP talks about digital filtering blah 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 cascaded integrator filters fast Fourier transforms I got that running on the F on, on, on pick 32 I wouldn't bother with fast Walsh transforms unless you're really interested in decomposing signals into orthogonal square waves 
No reason why an orthogonal transform has to be to sine waves. But uh, there's a section on Karpla's strong algorithm and what it sounds like. Uh, something, a, a, a piece on FM synthesis and a piece on additive synthesis. So by doing additive synthesis here, let's see, let's see if this will play. Does it sound like a struct string to you? Maybe yes, maybe no. So I chose five frequencies. 262 is pretty close to middle C. And then chose the amplitude of each of the harmonics, 11.5.3.1. One, one, one. That being something like the one over the one over F. Gave each one of them a different fall time because the higher frequencies decay faster. Gave all of them a fast rise time because after all you're smacking something. And that's the sound that comes out. Now if we do a so then I tried to do a drum, and the weird thing about a drum is that the for, for a, a square drum, you don't see many of those around, but for a square drum, the first non-zero harmonic above the fundamental is 1.58 times the fundamental. It's not harmonic, it's anharmonic. And if you, if you do that, again tune to middle C, you get something it sounds kind of vaguely chime-like or something. You could do better. Use the, so the 1.583, 2.24, and 2.55 are the first five harmonics of a square drum. Bells tend to be actually drum-like, but That's kind of believable. So you can do, you can do additive synthesis. If we do FM synthesis, that's an okay chime. Then we have, you know, then a, a, a rot, I mean, I, I gave names to these by saying, hey, that's kind of interesting. I wonder what it sounds like. Oh, uh, rod resonator. So th this, is, this is named after the fact. A bell. These are all quite cheap to do. Again, these are all like 5% of the CPU. Electric guitar, maybe that's being gracious. Uh, sound effect. Oh dear, that means I couldn't figure out what it sounded like. <laughs> and a bowed string. Now here I tried to to make the, the, the onset rather slow. Maybe boat stream, maybe, possibly. So, then using Carpless Strong with a, a white way, a white noise uh, pluck. Sounds pretty good. Using a triangle pluck. And you hear the background, that's because it's 8-bit arithmetic. You wouldn't hear that on a 32-bit system. And some other, some various other things. That's some... That's got some sort of weird onset thing because I was driving this with a with a square wave. <coughs> so 
you can make you can make kind of a, a variety of obscure but interesting sounds with these uh, with these systems. In uh, in fifty seven sixty, they use physical synthesis to to do drums. And I'll probably do that again this year because it's pretty entertaining. There's the power spectrum of a drum. And let's see, there's some examples here. 889 by 257 nodes. Okay, let's try... Oh, yes chicken can they they they, pl they programmed a uh, uh, uh. so they said so they're trying to come up with what that sounded like a glass that's glass hit folks <laughs> little bongo yeah maybe and then uh uh, where is it here? <coughs> Bass drum. Nope, that one's a different. Oh, Mary had a little lamb. Yeah, played 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 on an FPGA using push buttons. So there, the 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 emphasis is on parallel processing, and we have the students build between 400 and several thousand parallel processors, and then execute at audio rate. But um, For, for this, I would say you want to stay with one-dimensional stuff, although if somebody wants to try a two-dimensional drum structure, I think it's probably doable, just barely. So what do you want to hear about audio? What's the deal with uh, vocal signatures? So for vocal signatures, you mean... Uh, uh, what constitutes recognizing a human voice? Well, I've heard that it's similar to doing 14 point recognition on faces. It, Even if you disguise your voice, <clears throat> So the, the structure of the resonances of your throat are unique to you. Throat being including nose, vocal cavity, uh, uh, mouth cavity, and, and vocal cords. And no matter what you say, I can tell it's you within reason, just like on the phone even at three kilohertz bandwidth, no matter what she says, you can tell it's your mother's voice. And the it has to do with the distribution of energy among about six modes of your throat, although it could be as high as ten, but modes being resonances of your throat. <clears throat> and the way that this analysis is often done is you calculate, oh I should say this, yes, you calculate the MEL spectrum. Turns out your ear tends to analyze things in a logarithmic fashion, so if we have F versus amplitude, the spectral bandwidths look like this. These are the, 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 the The approximate, the approximate uh, uh, filter uh, bandwidths. So as you go to higher frequency, you go to wider bandwidth filters. And the typical way to do this is to calculate an FFT and then uh, uh, merge bins. So you get a spectrum. You get a MEL spectrum of a few dozen or a few hundred points, depending on how much resolution you want. Then you cosine transform that. 
and then you take the first 12 or 14 coefficients of the cosine transform and since it's kind of a spectrum of a spectrum it's called a sepstrum for who knows what reason but it's the it's the mel sepstrum is what's used it's the first 14 coefficients of the of the mel sepstrum that's used to identify voice because in some sense taking the Fourier transform of the Fourier transform gives you some idea of the periodicity of the resonances of your voice. And that seems to be pretty good at identifying humans, of which human, but not identifying what they're saying. I think that is just barely doable on pick 32 is to try and identify which of two partners is speaking. But if you want to do speech recognition, if you want to try and figure out what word is being spoken, typically the first step is to Fourier transform at say 10 millisecond increments or 16 millisecond increments. Fourier transform the signal, convert each of the Fourier slices into the MEL spectrum and then do pattern recognition on the MEL spectra. Did that answer what you asked? More or less? Yeah. People use it in law enforcement all the time, I think. Pardon me? People use it in law enforcement to prove that someone was somewhere. Well, <clears throat> within reason, yeah, I, I, I doubt if uh, an algorithm is as good as a human at, at, at detecting, discriminating differences between vocal tracks, but on the other hand, at least you could say that it's repeatable if it's an algorithm. Um, but it makes it hard to disguise your voice because you actually have to change the resonances of your throat. So you could stick a finger down your throat and that would change the resonances because it changes the shape of your throat. It's not very much fun to talk that way, but it, it really does mo modify your voice. Or anything else that changes the cross section of your throat as a function of distance along the throat will modify the resonances. There's also, this, so it's, you, you typically model the voice as a 10 pole filter with a couple of zeros for your nose. So what do you think? You want to hear more about this? You don't want to hear more about this? You don't care? Uh, what? I can do about one more lecture on sound synthesis if you want. I will try to get power management together by next time. It wasn't going to happen today because the whole morning is mapped. But what do you want to hear about? Well, Wednesday we're going to be in lab. And so Friday will, the default will be, I'll talk more about audio synthesis unless somebody voices a strong opinion one way or the other. Either here on Piazza or, so, or email or something. Okay, let's go.